we're going through Plato's Symposium, and we come at last to the entrance of Alcibiades. Now, I'm looking at the text here, and I'm seeing the Alcibiades section is actually pretty long, about as long as the Socrates speech, and I just don't know if I can do the whole thing in one video, although I have no idea where it would be a natural place to pause. Anyway, let's, let's see what happens. Alcibiades. Okay, so Alcibiades is a historical character. I think he actually is in the School of Athens, that famous painting by Raphael, the one with, with uh, Plato in the middle pointing upward and Soc uh, Aristotle in the middle uh, gesturing outward. Well, Alcibiades was a, not a great guy. He betrayed Athens. And this is in earlier days when he still seemed a very young and handsome and promising uh, man. And... Uh, you can read the symposium as, uh, in part, giving us Plato's defense of Socrates, explaining why it was Alcibiades' fault that he went bad and not Socrates' fault, because uh, Socrates would sometimes be blamed for former students of his, like Alcibiades, who later went bad and betrayed Athens or caused some other sort of trouble. So... Uh, we're in the Symposium of Plato using the Hackett edition in the complete works here. And we're at this uh, drinking party, and they've been giving speeches in praise of love. Alcibiades has not been at the party. Socrates has just finished his speech. And we are told Socrates' speech finished to loud applause. And Aristophanes was trying to make some sort of response over all the noise. <clears throat> then all of a sudden there was even more noise. A large drunken party had arrived at the courtyard door and they were rattling it loudly, accompanied by the shrieks of some flute girl they had brought along. Agathon at that point called to his slaves, Go see who it is. If it's people we know, invite them in. If not, tell them the party's over and we're about to turn in. A moment later, they heard Alcibiades shouting in the courtyard, very drunk and very loud. He wanted to know where Agathon was. He demanded to see Agathon at once. Actually, he was half carried into the house by the flute girl and by some other companions of his, but at the door he managed to stand by himself, crowned with a beautiful wreath of violets and ivy and ribbons in his hair. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm plastered, he announced. May I join your party? Or should I crown Agathon which, with this wreath, which is all I came to do anyway, and make myself scarce? I really couldn't make it yesterday, he continued, but nothing could stop me tonight. See, I'm wearing the garland myself. I want this crown to come directly from my head to the head that belongs, I don't mind saying, to the cleverest and best-looking man in town. Ah, you laugh, you think I'm drunk, fine, go ahead, I know I'm right anyway. Well, what do you say? May I join you in these terms? Will you have a drink with me or not? Alcibiades is just that, um, uh, that ridiculous, that vain, that drunk, uh, whichever of those adjectives apply. So, naturally, they all made a big fuss. They implored him to join them. They begged him to take a seat, and Agathon called him to his side. So Alcibiades, again, with the help of his friends, <laughs> he can't even walk straight, approached Agathon. And, uh, et cetera, um, oh, an ivy in his face from the wreath. And he didn't notice that Socrates uh, is on the same couch as Agathon. So Alcibiades sat down between Socrates and Agathon. And he puts his arms around Agathon and kisses him and places the ribbons on his head. And Agathon asked his slaves to take Alcibiades' sandals off. We can all three fit on my couch, he said. What a good idea, Alcibiades replied. But wait a moment, who's the third? As he said this, he turned around, and it was only then that he saw Socrates. No sooner had he seen him than he leaped up, and he cried, Good Lord, what's going on here? It's Socrates. You've trapped me again. You always do this to me. All of a sudden, you'll turn up out of nowhere where I least expect you. Well, what do you want now? Why did you choose this particular couch? Why aren't you with Aristophanes or anyone else we could tease you about? But no, you figured out a way to find a place next to the, hands the most handsome man in the room. Socrates says, replying to Agathon, not Aristophanes, I beg you, Agathon, protect me from this man. You can't imagine what it's like to be in love with him. From the very first moment he realized how I felt about him, he hasn't allowed me to say two words to anybody else. What am I saying? I can't so much as look at an attractive man, but he flies into a fit of jealous rage. He yells, he threatens, he could hardly keep from slapping me around. Please try to keep him under control. Could you perhaps make him forgive me? And if you can't, if he gets violent, will you defend me? The fierceness of his passion terrifies me. There, there's probably a lot of nuance that is lost on me because, well, honestly, I'm just reading it in the English. Um, and perhaps any number of other reasons. There's probably a lot of nuance that's lost on a lot of us for cultural or other reasons. But uh, 
it may be that philosophy has never been this gay. And uh, it may be that it's more nuanced than you would think. At any rate, what is going on? Let's see how, I can, uh, how well I can summarize some of this. What's going on is Socrates and Alcibiades have a past. And in this past, uh, Socrates has had the lover relationship and Agathon the one being loved relationship or something like that. And uh, here we must keep in mind the speech of Pausanias. We must also keep in mind the speech of Socrates, where Pausanias thought that uh, the Athenian homosexual customs are also mentoring educational customs in their good, where the, the older, wiser man takes a younger, <laughs> takes on in his, as his lover a younger man, a younger, promising, handsome man, and does get sexual favors from him, but also uh, mentors him. And uh, when and the uh, the Athenian customs for these relationships promote virtue. We're supposed they, they they help to make sure that um, virtuous young men are paired with virtuous older man older men for relationships where uh, where virtue is fostered in the young by the old. But we also have to remember Socrates' uh, speech, where. Where, again, I'm not trying to say this as a pun, but uh, it's much more platonic. Where a person will be in love with a promising younger man. A man, a man. This is, these are all men talking here. Um, the man will be, a man will be in love with a younger man, but that doesn't mean anything sexual. Uh, at least it's not obvious that it does. It, it's actually, I think actually Socrates says that at the stage, or he has Diodom, he recounts Diodom as saying this to him. Uh, at the stage where you've moved on pa caring about uh, bodies at all. Uh, this is a love of the soul, and it's all that virtue and education stuff, but without any of the sexual favors, uh, the way Socrates seems to be talking. So Alcibiades and Socrates uh, have some sort of past, and in this past, uh, Socrates has loved Agathon, but it has not been sexual in quite the same way as Pausanias would have, would have thought, would have approved of. And uh, part of the complication with the backstory of Socrates and Alcibiades seems to be that Alcibiades wanted to do this Pausanias' way, and Socrates wanted to do this Diotima's way, their, their past uh, love relationship, that is. So uh, that's part of the complicated past of Socrates and Alcibiades. And Alcibiades says, I shall never forgive you. Actually, it says Alcibiades cried. I shall never forgive you. I promise you you'll pay for this. But for the moment, he says, turning to Agathon, give me some of these ribbons. I'd better make a wreath for him as well. Look at that magnificent head. Otherwise, I know he'll make a scene. He'll be grumbling that, though I crowned you for your first victory, I didn't honor him, even though he has never lost an argument in his life. So Alcibiades took the ribbons, arranged them on Socrates' head, and lay back on the couch. Immediately, however, he started up again. Friends, you look sober to me. We can't have that. Let's have a drink. Remember our agreement? We need a master of ceremonies. Who should it be? Well, at least till you are all too drunk to care, I elect myself. Who else? Agathon, I want the largest cup around. And, and he corrects himself and asks not for a cup, but for a jar uh, that could hold more wine. He had the slaves fill it to the brim, drained it, and ordered them to fill it up again for Socrates. And then he observes that um, Socrates doesn't get drunk no matter how much alcohol you put in him. And then Eric, Eric Sibicus, the doctor, says... Uh, this is certainly most improper. We cannot simply pour the wine down our throats in silence. We must have some conversation, or at least a song. What we are doing now is hardly civilized. And uh, Alcibiades uh, greets Eric, uh, and it's probably somewhat disrespectful. Oh, let's just read it. What Alcibiades said to him was this. Oh, Eric Simicus, best possible son to the best possible, the most temperate father. Hi. Greetings to you, too, Eric Simicus replied. Now what do you suggest we do? Whatever you say, ours to obey you, for a medical mind is worth a million others, says Aristophanes. Please describe what you see fit. And then Eric describes how they've been giving speeches in praise of love, and he suggests that Alcibiades have uh, a turn giving speeches in giving a speech in praise of love. And I think probably... Mm, probably... 
probably will stop there after just a tiny bit more, and uh, I'll just um, I'll take this as a, a natural stopping point. Uh, this video will be the appearance, the entrance of Alcibiades, and then the speech of Alcibiades perhaps can be the next video. Uh, Socrates, uh, Eric, Alcibiades. Alcibiades says, Do you really think it's fair to put up, uh, to put my drunken ramblings next to your sober orations? And anyway, I, I hope you didn't believe a single word Socrates said. The truth is just the opposite. Uh, he is the one who will most surely beat me up if I dare praise anyone else in his presence, even a god. Socrates responds, hold your tongue. And Alcibiades shouts in response, by God, don't you dare deny it. I would never, never praise anyone else with you around. And Eric says, well then, why don't you praise Socrates? Why don't you give a speech in praise of Socrates? What do you mean, asked Alcibiades. Do you really think so, Eric Symmachus? Should I unleash myself upon him? Should I give him his punishment in front of all of you? So Alcibiades is super drunk and has this um, uh, past relationship with Socrates that he's about to tell the story of. And he's angry at Socrates for Socrates' behavior in this relationship. And he's being uh, far too, far too uh, forthcoming, perhaps, uh, in his drunkenness. And... And he talks like Socrates wants all the glory, and Socrates seems to disagree, and uh, Aristophanes, Alcibiades. Alcibiades says, you will only hear the truth. He says, I'll only tell the truth. Please let me. And Socrates says, I would certainly like to hear the truth from you. By all means, go ahead. And I will stop there. And uh, what shall we say about this? Uh... Socrates has not heard the truth from Alcibiades before. That's what he wants. That's what he always wanted. And we're just going to get more of the same here. We're going to get uh, the backstory on why or how Socrates wanted only the truth from Alcibiades and never got it. And, and more on that in the next video. Thank you for watching.